This is the podcast of The Branch in Ashland, Virginia. The dictionary defines the word provision as the supplying of something, especially food or other necessities. While we may all agree on this definition, we may have different opinions of what things are necessities to us. Necessities could be food or clothing to us, while others of us may have never struggled with those essentials, and we look to things like savings accounts or retirement plans or other things as necessities. God's people had a first-hand glimpse into what provision looked like after God rescued them from Pharaoh's hand in Egypt. They wandered in the desert for 40 years, and God was the one who provided for their needs. Today we look at Exodus 16, where God not only provides for the physical needs of his people, but also for the spiritual and emotional needs of his people. He provides them with food each day, not allowing them to have more than what they need beyond that day. But he also provides a day out of the week to rest and recharge, to disconnect and cease from laboring. As we look at how God provided for his people so long ago, there are things for us to consider here in the 21st century. Let's take some time to reflect on that. You know, we, uh, we Americans are somewhat obsessed with um, saving in the future. Um, but it's interesting if you look at the statistics of saving in, in our world, in our country. Among Americans who are 60 or older, only 13% have um, or 13% have no retirement savings. Um, and, and then the younger you get, the more that that number increases. So when we go to the 45 to 59 age bracket, uh, that, that number increases to 17%. And then when we drop down again, 30 to 44 year olds, uh, that number increases to 26%. And then for those between the ages of 18 and 29, that number increases to 42%. In 2019, 34 million people lived in poverty in America. For a family of four, that means earning just $25,000 per year. And in 2017, there was an estimated 553,742 people in the United States experiencing homelessness on a given night. That represents a rate of approximately 17 people out of every 10,000 in the general population experiencing homelessness. And when we look at those statistics, it tells us a different story of of what it means to be provided for. How do we determine if our provisions are met? Is it that we have a roof over our head at the end of the day? Is it that we have a meal on the table? In the morning, the evening, is it that we're not living in poverty as it's defined here? That we're able to save money for retirement or even uh, have a sizable investment as well? And sometimes for those of us who consider ourselves to be followers of Christ, disciples of Christ, we we throw around terms and, and, and sometimes we don't always think about what those terms mean. But we might say, hey, God provides. But what does that really mean for us? Does that mean he provides our needs? Does it mean he provides our wants? Does it mean um, that there's things missing in our lives? What do provisions look like for us? When God's people were in the wilderness, they saw God's provision for them firsthand in a way that I wonder if we always uh, can see. I think until we've really experienced uh, a lack of something, we have a hard time understanding what provision really looks like. But you think about uh, what happened with the people of God. They were, they were in Egypt, although they were enslaved and in bondage. They were freed. They were moving towards the promised land. They looked behind them and the Egyptian armies doing the backstroke in the Red Sea. But what did provision look like for them? If you have a Bible, you can turn to Exodus chapter 16. You know, look at this in a few parts. So just the first 16 verses 
here. And, and let me say, too, I, you know, there's a, there's a blessing and a curse about having to stand up in front of people and share things, especially when it comes to, to hard things. Um, because I'm not the kind of person who just gets up, does a lot of study, and then says, well, this is great. I'm going to package this all in a nice package and present it to you. Generally, what ends up happening is I have to go through it before I'm going to present it. And so even this morning, I was on my, my walk, um, and I was struggling. I was struggling with what provision looks like for me. And so as we go through this, like, hope maybe you're going to feel like, oh, yeah, I have no problem. I don't struggle with this at all. This is like a breeze for me. Hey, great, more power to you. If you're struggling with it, know that I'm a fellow struggler with you in this. That thinking about God's provision and even having this idea of God's provision is one thing, but embracing it can be a completely and totally different thing. So looking at Exodus chapter 16, Starting in verse 1, the whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. That's probably a place I try to stay away from. But um, on the 15th day of the second month of after, they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you've brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. I, I think they're a little dramatic here, but, you know, I wasn't in their situation. And the Lord said to Moses, I'll rain down bread from heaven for you. The people were to go out each day, gather enough for that day. In this way, I'll test them and see whether they'll follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they're to prepare what they bring in, and that's to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. And so Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you'll know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. In the morning you'll see the glory of the Lord, because he's heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, You'll know it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening, and all the bread you want in the morning, because he's heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You're not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. And Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he's heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I've heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you'll eat meat, and in the morning you'll be filled with bread, and you'll know that I am the Lord your God. And that evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It's the bread the Lord's given you. This is what the Lord's commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. And stuff right there. They've, they've been on this journey, it tells us, for, for a month and a half. It doesn't take long, right? Like any of us who deal with people know that given enough time, people will complain. And sure enough, Moses and Aaron at the front of this, they're the ones who get the whole brunt of this. And it's funny because, as I mean, I've heard of being hangry before, but like this is like a whole new kind of hangry in the Israelites, right? Their stomachs start grumbling, and all of a sudden, they rise up, and they're like, oh boy, we wish we were back in, in Egypt again. We wish we had the food that we had there. But did they forget that they had to eat that food with chains on? Did they forget that they were in bondage? How does God respond to them? You know, I, I think... Here's a picture of God's grace and how he responds to the people of Israel here. He doesn't get angry. He doesn't rain down wrath on them. In fact, he rains down bread from heaven and he gives them quail to eat and so that they'll have enough. Not for that day, and God tells them this will be a test for them to see if they'll really trust him, that they'll take enough And yet it's another reminder to us that God can handle our honesty. You know, the Israelites, they were honest about where they were. 
He said, you know what? We're not happy about the situation we're in. We wish we were back there in Egypt. But here we are. I think sometimes we're, we're afraid to share with God what we're really feeling, what we're really experiencing inside. But the reality is he knows it. Whether we actually say it to him or not, he sees it. He sees our heart. So what keeps us from being as honest as the Israelites were? Say, you know what? This stinks. <laughs> like, we do not like this. People grumbled and God heard them and he met their needs. Moses presents the news to the Israelites, the people of God, and reminds them that, hey, guess what? Like, you're, you're killing the messenger here. Instead of the one who sent us, he, he's the one to be mad at, basically. And the Israelites, they, he, they present to the Israelites the plan that they'll have enough food with meat in the evening and bread in the morning. Now, if the Israelites' tables were anything like my table at home, then you know that every single time a meal comes to the table, someone's not happy, right? Like, seriously, uh, you, you bring food, and, and no matter what you do, you ask, you go through all the process before you go shopping, and then you bring the food, and someone turns their nose up at it, right? Like, it, I don't know if, if it's possible, although we've experienced it maybe once or twice, where, where you bring that food and everyone's good. So imagine, like, some of us are families of three, four, five. Like, if that happens in five, like, there were three quarters of a million people here. Like, think about what that looked like in Israel. Like, if I were Moses and Aaron, I'd be like, peace out, I'm going back to Egypt, because I don't want to deal with that. And God said, hey, I'm going to provide for your need. Here's the thing I think we need to ask ourselves. Are we happy and content with what we're given, or do we define God's provision based on whether or not we like it? And I think that's a really, really important question for us to ask in light of this. If you had asked the Israelites, hey, are you being provided for? They may have said, yeah, well, you know, if you ask our kids and when they come to the table, hey, are you being provided for? They're like, yeah, I don't really like Brussels sprouts. Like, so no, I'm not being provided for. I think perspective changes how we look at provision. And it, it lets us know whether we're being content with what we're given or we're just saying, hey, what I've been given isn't really what I like, so I don't feel like God's providing for me. Throughout this, when God provides for them, he tells them that they'll know he is the Lord God, the one who brought them out of Egypt. He keeps reminding them of this over and over and over again. And we've mentioned this before as we've been looking through Exodus, that God needs to remind us over and over and over again because we forget. We forget and we get in this self-pity attitude and we start looking at ourselves and we forget about his faithfulness. We forget about his goodness to us. So God provides them meat in the form of quail. He provides them a wafer, bread-like substance. It's funny because it's called manna, which, is, which means what is it? So, I mean, uh, it is what it is, right? Like, <clears throat> but they're told to gather only as much as they need. And here, in this sense of community that they've been forced into, we begin to see what happens um, in community. And the messiness of community. That they were supposed to put it all together. That some people um, would go out and they would pull in all this food and other people weren't quite as good at it. And so um, when they put it all together and pulled it all together, then they'd share that out. And no one would have too much. No one would have too little. But they gathered it all, and we see what community looks like here. And I wonder, what would it look like if we began to see this kind of thing in our communities? Like if we didn't go with a selfish approach to say, hey, how do I take things 
Uh, have, you, have you ever gone to a, and you know, every year, I wonder when it's going to stop, but every year right around Easter, um, my wife and I go out and hide eggs for our kids, and they're getting older, so it gets a little bit more intense the older they get. But for, for an Easter egg hunt, you watch. If it doesn't happen with your kids, God bless you. Then just go to a community Easter egg hunt, and you watch the kids, right? Like there's some kids who are just like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to walk along, throw a few eggs in my basket, and at the end of the day, it's okay. And then there's like the intense ones, right? Like I have one of these, right? Like if you get, I, I, I'm like putting my eye on all these things. I've got my crosshairs on these eggs. And if anybody gets in the way, they're done, <laughs> right? Like I'm going to plow them over and just make sure that those eggs, they're mine. And at the end of it, it's a competition. Like even if you say, hey, it's okay. Well, think about that in regards to the manna, right? Like, can you imagine there's some people out there, they're just putting the baskets, and then there's the other one who's like, oh, that's mine, that's mine. But at the end of the day, God knew that there were both kinds of people and everything in between, and he said, we're going to pull it all together, and then we're going to share it out. We see it with Israel, but what would it look like if the church began to live in such a way that we started to say, hey, we don't want anybody in the community around us to have too much or too little. How can we bridge that gap? I think one of the reasons why this fails in our country is because the wrong people are at the head of it. And I don't want to get overly political here, but when government, government is in charge of things, sorry, Sean, but when government is in charge of things, it stinks. But what happens when the church of Jesus Christ takes the lead on stuff and says, hey, how do we model this well so that there's nobody who finds themselves in the pit and there's no one who finds themselves on the pedestal, but in the middle of it all, we come together. That's the beauty of the table. Moses tells them not to take too much. We continue in this, and we see what happens. Starting in verse 17. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much. The one who gathered little didn't have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. And Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. <laughs> That's leadership 101, right? They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. Think about that. Like, you're the one who decided, I'm going to keep a little bit more, and then you've got the smelly tent, right? Like, so you're left with the smelly tent. Each morning, everyone gathered as much as they needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person, and the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever's left and keep it until morning. And so they saved it until morning as Moses commanded. It didn't stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You'll not find any of it on the ground today. In six days you're to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it. <laughs> no matter what he says, they still ignore him, right? But they found none. The Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That's why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day. No one is to go out. And so the people rested on the seventh day. There's always, there's at least one in every crowd, right? right? They, they, even though Moses instructed them, hey, you don't need to keep too much, only for today. Some of them still stockpiled it. They had smelly tents. They went on. But God provided for them so much so that he introduced this new concept, which is going to be a big part of the community here, this concept of the Sabbath. And that um, they were going to have enough even on that sixth day. 
And even though if on the first through fifth days, if they had gathered and put it away, it would, it would stink and it would have maggots in it. On that sixth day, if they gathered enough for the next day, none of that would happen. Because God was providing for them. You know, as you look at how much the people gathered and then coming together and sorting it out and, and giving enough to everybody, again, asking that question of how much do we need? You know, how much is enough? And Jesus had words for us, for his followers in Matthew chapter 6, about what we do in regards to the future and our needs. In Matthew 6.25, he says, therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than them? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? If we go back to Genesis and we go back to how God created us, and all of creation, we see that there's a distinction between the fact that God created everything, but the only thing that he created in his image was humanity. And so God sees us different than he sees the rest of humanity. And that's not something to take as prideful. It's something to take as, as being a steward of what we've been given. We've been created in the image of God, and how do we respond to that? in our uniqueness? Do we trust that God, when he created us in his image, didn't just say, okay, well, I'm going to create everything, and you guys, you're in my image. All right, see you later. I'm, I'm going to walk away. Or do we trust that he said, because you're in my image, I'm looking at you different. I'm going to provide for you different. And what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6 is that if you consider the birds of the air, that, that they don't sow or reap, but somehow or another they have enough for that day. You don't see them starving every single day. So what do we do with that? How do we respond when we think about God providing? Are we not more important than the birds? The birds weren't created in the image of God, but we were. God will provide, it might not be what we think we need, but it will be what he knows we need. You know, God met the physical needs of the Israelites by providing the meat and the bread for them, but he also provided for their spiritual and emotional needs as well by setting aside this Sabbath day. This is the first time in Scripture that we're introduced to this idea of Sabbath, but God set forth in Genesis in the creative order of things that there would be a day set aside for us to rest. God didn't need rest. It's not like he was like, man, I'm tired. I need to go sit down in my easy chair. No. God did that for us. And here he introduces it, and when we continue on in Exodus and, and beyond, we'll see that God gives the people the Ten Commandments. And one of the Ten Commandments was specifically about this day, this Sabbath, that they would stop, that they would cease, that they would rest. God provides for our physical, emotional, and spiritual rest by giving us a Sabbath. It's not just a day to catch up on everything that we've not gotten to throughout the week. A Sabbath is what God intends for it to be, is rest, so that we can recharge. But how do we do that? When's the last time that you weren't on vacation that you simply rested? Like stopped, ceased, was still. When's the last time that you ceased from laboring? And how do we model that for others? You know, do we trust, I think, as I think about Sabbath, and I think about the reasons why I would break that concept of stopping and ceasing and not resting, it's because I don't trust that I can get everything done in the other time. Nor do I trust that God is going to provide beyond what I've done in that time. Like, I've got to somehow make up for it. 
My lack of keeping Sabbath, I think, is my lack of trust in God's provision. Because I feel like I've got to make up for everything that's been lost or even get ahead on that seventh day. And, you know, I don't think God's up there saying, oh, hey, um, you're not keeping the Sabbath on this specific day in this 24-hour period. There's some people who may be more legalistic about it. I'm just wondering how often we actually stop and cease and rest for a 24-hour period. Hey, some people might say, hey, you look lazy when you do that. Hey, just tell them, God, God told me to do this. But we're called to cease and rest. The last instruction that we see further down in Exodus 16 is God, uh, Moses says to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it, and they place it before the Lord. And, and eventually that that a jar goes into the Ark of the Covenant, which we'll see if we keep reading through the Bible. That's the place where the Ten Commandments are, where Moses, uh, Aaron had a, a budding rod that they put in there as well. But there's only two places that I can see where that manna won't spoil. It's on the sixth day when they gather enough for the seventh, and it's here when they put the manna in a jar as a remembrance to them in the Ark of the Covenant. It's not just for them, but for generations to come. Think about what God did with that bread, that even though it would spoil past the 24-hour mark, God somehow preserves it for the people to remember for generations and generations. And for the first time, as many times as I've read through this, I had never thought about the fact that God gives his people bread to remember. And you think about what happens when Jesus is on the earth, that he takes a meal with his disciples and he takes bread and he said, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way that God had given his people bread to remember his provision for them, Jesus, in a very real, in a very incarnational way, comes to his people and says, here is bread in remembrance of what I'm going to do for you to show that I've provided for you. God provided for his people in the Old Testament in a very physical way. But we see in the New Testament that God, through bread, provides for his people in a spiritual way, in a way that we could never provide for our own. And in both cases, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, these are God's provision for his people in ways that they can never do on their own. There's no way that they can say, oh yeah, we made the, the bread come down. We, we gathered on it. Maybe someone had a quail call, and they're all like, I don't know what quail's Maybe Leslie could tell me what, what quails sound quails make, but but like they I don't think someone was like the quail caller and they all like came. Like God made them come. And then they couldn't say anything but thank you. Thank you for your provision for us, God. Now they ate that manna for 40 years. Now, Think about, some of us have a menu that like recycles at the end of every week, and still people aren't happy about that. Like, think about what that is like to eat the same thing. Forget about day after day, week after week, month after month, but like for four decades, they ate the same thing. So next time someone complains at your table, just think, hey, it's not manna, right? <laughs> so what do we do with all this? I think asking ourselves that question, what does provision look like for us? We see God's provision physically, spiritually for his people. What are the expectations that we have in order that our provisions might be met? And ask yourself, what are you trying to store up for yourself that you don't think God will provide? I think that's at the heart of, of why they gathered more than they needed for that day. Because they said, we don't trust you, God, that there's going to be enough. And so we're going to do more. And so I wonder what we as individuals are trying to store up for ourselves because we don't trust that God's going to provide it. And then this one. And hey, like I said at the beginning, this is a growing edge. 
for me, for all of us, I think. Are we taking advantage of Sabbath rest that God created for us? Are we stopping? Are we ceasing? Are we enjoying one another? You know, I think that our perspective of what heaven looks like can be really clouded based upon our perspective of Sabbath rest. And I think if we think about the things that give us rest, um, then like some of us rest by getting dirty in a garden. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But are we really resting? Are we resting from our, our struggles and our striving? Are we ceasing to really work? I encourage you to think about that. You know, if it means mapping out your schedule and saying, where are the moments in my schedule where I'm stopping, where I'm ceasing? And even looking and saying, hey, like maybe it can't be a 24-hour period at first. Start somewhere, even somewhere small. And for those of us who have younger kids, I know it's a challenge. Like locking yourself in the bathroom or the closet doesn't always work um, because someone inevitably bangs on the door, right? Find ways, husbands, wives, find ways to help each other in this. Can we help each other to experience Sabbath? Because God called us to this. And so may we see God's provision in what he does, and may we trust that it's provision for today, for tomorrow, and for the days ahead. Let me pray for us. God, thank you. Thank you for the ways that you provide for us. Help us to trust that it's enough. Help us to trust that you are enough and you will supply our needs and provide all that we need. Thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I can be honest and admit there are things in my life that I want to store up beyond today. Even though God's telling me to trust him in it, I'd much rather take control myself than trust what I can't see and can't always understand. But God showed his faithfulness to his people time and time again. They didn't go hungry, they didn't starve, even in the wilderness. Think about those verses in Matthew 6 again. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Do we believe that we have more value than the birds? Would God provide for them and not provide for us? Faith and trust are hard, especially when we want to hold things in our own hands. What's God calling you to entrust him with? How are you striving and trying to create a surplus for yourself when God's told you he'll give you enough? I hope you'll consider some of these questions in the days ahead. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to our podcast. If you have any comments or questions, please email us at thebranchashland at gmail.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks again for listening.